for this fifth and final tutorial for Abandoned House series. We are going to finish this environment. We are going to focus on beyond the house area to build up more believable outer boundaries of the map. This will include adding more props. We'll add a cornfield right in front of the house. We'll add telephone poles. We'll add tree cards to create a believable tree line far off in the distance. This will help to optimize the map so we don't include foliage props everywhere, especially far away where the player cannot reach. Then we'll add more foliage to bridge the gap between a tree card and the nearby props for foliage. And we'll also add roadblocks, sections where the player cannot go through to let them know that this section is blocked off. And we'll be fixing any problems we find along the way. Things like blending of textures, positioning some props to the ground, changing some prop settings, and just catching anything that we find as we continue to work on this and finish this up. Then we'll finish up by updating the skybox to a new sky texture, changing the light, adding another sun environment entity, inserting a fog, including a tone map controller, which will control our HDR settings. Then we'll fire that tone map controller through Logic Auto. And then last, we'll do a color correction, which will allow you to change colors of your scene. And we'll do a final compile on full compile. And this is what we are going to end up with. Let's go, let's go. Let's begin. I start off by opening the previous version of the map, Terrain, and save it as a new version, Beyond the House. I first focus on inserting props outside the playable area. This includes a water tower, cornfield, fence, a broken down truck, and telephone poles. I duplicate one of the existing props, and then I go into properties to change the world model. This tends to be the fastest way to add a new prop by changing the existing prop world model inside settings rather than going to entities, inserting a prop static, and doing it that way. And then when I insert the water tower, I add it to a vis group called Beyond and I disable collisions. So every single prop that's outside the playable area will not have any collisions because the player will never be interacting with those props. And little things like this will help to optimize your map. After I've inserted a water tower, I duplicate that water tower and then change the wall model to a cornfield. And I begin to position them in front of the house. When I do this, it requires me to begin optimizing the displacement underneath it to make sure that the cornfield is not buried into the displacement. So I have to shift back and forth between positioning the cornfield and then modify the displacement underneath it. So I do this for quite a large section near the road and towards the back of the terrain behind the cornfield. I also begin to insert a fence to separate the road from the cornfield. And that fence does have collision enabled because I wanted to block the player and prevent them from going into the cornfield. The fence also forces me to modify the terrain to make sure that that fence is not going too deep into the displacement. And I am raising, lowering and smoothing the terrain to make sure it's even with the fence and the cornfield. And I actually spend a lot of time here modifying, tweaking and fixing. And that the fence in the cornfield is properly positioned. I then need to compile and test to see how everything looks so far and if I catch any problems early. So I take a look at the fence, I take a look at the cornfield, and the water tower in the distance. Once I'm happy with how the cornfield section looks so far, and I don't need to fix any problems, I add a tow truck that's going to be positioned down the road. This truck is outside the playable boundaries of the map, and by including something that a player can never reach 
but they can see helps to sell your world better. So the truck in the distance implies that the world is bigger and expands beyond the playable boundaries. And same with the water tower. I also begin to add telephone poles that will stretch from one end of the map, continue along the road to the other side. So I inserted the telephone poles first and then for electric wires, I use keyframe rope entity. And these are very easy to set up. You have to define the name, then the next keyframe to where the rope is going to connect to the next keyframe rope entity and slack, which controls how low the wire is going to hang. So I set these up and then I duplicate them all the way across to each telephone pole all the way across the map. Then I quickly compile and jump in game to see if all of the keyframe rope entities have been correctly set up. And once I'm happy with how the telephone wires and the telephone poles look, I jump back in the editor, add one more telephone pole, which is going to connect to the house. I position it next to the tree and the fence, closer to the house, and I replace the original electric box that we placed in the detailing section. And I change it to a better electric box that allows me to connect the wire into it. It just seems more natural and looks better. So then I use another keyframe rope entity and I connect it from the electric box to the telephone pole next to the fence and the tree and then to the telephone pole that go alongside the road. And this is how you would naturally see electricity being wired to the house. You would have telephone poles that go along the road and then they would extend and connect to each house. My next step is to begin focusing on foliage elements for the exterior boundaries of the map. This will include tree cards and additional prop statics for trees and shrubs. First, I'm beginning to insert tree cards. And the tree card is a flat BSP brush with a texture of trees applied. And that texture contains an alpha channel, which removes the background. So all you see are trees. So if you position this tree card, off in the distance far away, it'll be almost impossible for the player to tell a difference if it's a prop static or a tree card. And this creates very believable and optimized way for you to insert more foliage without having to continuously duplicate very expensive props off in the distance. So I end up creating two large BSP brushes with two different tree textures applied. I align those textures so they appear large enough on that brush then to make the tree cards look better and more optimized, I turn the front face of each brush into a displacement and I curve out that tree card so it doesn't appear flat. And this ends up looking better in game. So I only create two different tree cards and I shape the displacement so it's not flat and it's more curved. And once I have them done, then I can begin to duplicate and position them all around the environment. I start on one end of the map and I take both of those tree cards and duplicate them all around the exterior boundaries far away so they're not too close to the playable area. As I'm duplicating I am varying the positions so they don't appear to be the same all across the map. And also when I begin to insert additional prop statics for trees and shrubs in the middle area between the tree cards and the fence, which will help to hide some of the repeated patterns in the tree cards. The one very important thing I do when I position these tree cards or any other element in the exterior boundaries of the map is I reference from the point of view of the player inside the playable area. So you always want to check how your exterior boundaries of the map look from the player's perspective because that's the only thing that matters, is how the player is going to view your map. So as I position these trees, I make sure that I go inside the playable area and I look outside to see if I need to reposition and move some of the tree cards. Then once I like how they look inside the editor, I need to compile and test in game. Here I am judging how the tree cards look only from the playable area. I'm walking around the house and trying to catch any problems or any visual inconsistencies that may need to be changed. And so far I like how everything looks. So now my next step is to focus on inserting foliage props in between the tree cards and the foliage props near the fence. 
This will help me to bridge that gap of empty landscape with additional detail. So I end up having more dense and more detailed props next to the fence and next to the playable area. This is where you would probably want to spend the most time in. Then you insert the tree cards on the outer boundaries of the map. So when you look off into the distance, it looks like you have a lot more foliage props placed and it creates a very realistic tree line. And then you want to focus on placing more props in between, but not as many as you did near or in playable areas. So I'm duplicating already existing foliage props and moving them off into the middle. I'm taking different trees, different shrubs, and trying to find the best placement as they would be seen from the player's perspective. For all of the foliage props in the middle area, I've disabled collision and I've placed them in their own vis group. And once I've duplicated all these foliage props around in the middle area, and I like how they look inside the editor, once again, I need to compile and test in game. Inside the map, I am looking at how this middle section now looks. I'm looking at how it bridges the gap between the tree cards and the playable area foliage. And if there is a sense of unity, between these three sections. I'm looking at from the road and from the missing fence section. And as I do this, I write down if anything needs to be changed or updated. Again, I can't stress enough how important it is for you to constantly check what you've done so far in game from the player's point of view, so you can catch and fix your problems early. Once I'm happy with the foliage section, I move on to creating roadblocks. This is where you block off sections of your map with additional props or BSP brushes to prevent the player from going beyond into the non-playable areas. So I already have this in the map with the fence near the cornfield and around the house. But now I need something for the road and the missing fence section. So I need to visually let the player know that this section is blocked off and is off limits. Otherwise they'll either be able to go into the non-playable area or they'll hit an invisible wall and neither solution is good. So I insert additional props that will let the player visually know they can't get past this point. And to make sure that they will never get to the exterior boundaries of the map, I will create a brush with a clip texture that will block all player movement. And this brush will be invisible in game. So I begin to insert props to block off the road. For one part of the road, I use a tree a few tires and a corroded panel. And for the other side, I use a truck, paint bucket, tires, and plywood. For the missing fence section, I use a few cinder blocks and a corroded panel leading up against the fence and being supported by these cinder blocks. So these visual cues tell the player that you cannot get past these points. Depending on the environment you are creating, some of these sections will be easier to design and block off than others. The easiest way would be having a wall, a gate, or a fence that naturally blocks you from the exterior boundaries of the map. But other sections, like the road, you'll have to design a way to block them off. And you can look at some of the official maps, like Militia, Nuke, or Save House, to see how Valve did it to get some ideas. But also pay attention to your reference to help you design how to block off these sections. Once I'm done with blocking off the road and the fence area, I compile and test in game. I'm looking at the positioning of each prop, making sure that it's making contact with the ground, that nothing is floating, intersecting, and that each section looks natural. Looking over all three sections, I like where they're at. And at this point of the process, I need to move on and focus on environmental effects and lighting. So the first thing I need to do is update the sky. The current sky we have is the default sky from dust. To update it, go to map, map properties, and change skybox texture name to a different sky name. You can find a list of texture sky names on Valve Software Developer Wiki page. You can scroll down into the blog post to find the link, or go to Google and search for CSGO Skylist. Once the sky box has been updated with a new texture that is close to my image reference and the environment idea that I'm going for. Next is to update light environment. So I go back to the developer valve software wiki page and underneath the same sky box texture you used, 
you will find a list of values to use inside your light environment. So instead of trying to figure out these values yourself, you can use the ones provided for you as a starting point and then tweak them to fit your map. I use values from CS Militia and I copy and paste all the values for pitch, yaw and roll, pitch, brightness and ambient. And then I tweak all the values to fit my environment. I then compile and test. I need to check the skybox and lighting and see how they fit together. I'm also observing the entire unity of the environment. How the lighting, shadow, skybox, foliage, exterior boundaries, as well as the most important, the house, and how they look together. And I like the direction this is going. I jump back into the editor and I add environment sun entity. This entity gives me a sun disk in the sky. It doesn't emit any light, but it gives you a glowing sun sprite that simulates a sun disk. And in the properties, I have to update using the values from light environment. So pitch your unroll and pitch are the same. This will ensure that the environment sun sprite is in the same position as the direction of your light environment. I then quickly compile and see what it looks like in game. The next entity I need to insert is fog. And I use environment fog controller entity. I place it into the map. I enable fog, set up primary fog color, set up fog start and and for Z clip plane. In order to see what it looks like, again, you have to compile and test in game. I'm looking at how fog begins to blend with the background and the exterior boundaries of the map. If it creates a realistic atmospheric perspective far off into the distance and into the tree cards. You'll have to play around with the values a bit to find the correct numbers for your map. But if you compile on fast option, it shouldn't take you too long to compile and test to find the fog values you like. Back in the editor, I duplicate the cube maps and position one on each side of the house. This will ensure that the calculations for reflection are correct in each window. So I duplicate one for each side, front and back, and I position them somewhere halfway through the first floor and second floor. Next, I insert a tone map controller. This entity will control HDR values in your map, high dynamic range, and HDR simulates outer exposure of how your eyes begin to adjust when you walk in from light into dark or from dark into light. So I insert a tone map controller, I give it a name, tone map, and then I compile using full compile HDR only configuration. The reason I'm doing this is because I need to jump in game and find the values I want to use. The three properties that I need are exposure maximum, exposure minimum, and bloom scale. If you don't use a tone map controller entity, then your map will use default HDR values. And they work good for most of the time, but you want to have more control over the creation of your environment. And for that, we need to find the right numbers to use, and then back in the editor, we'll set them up to execute on map spawn. So I've inserted a tone map controller, named it, compiled the map on full compile HDR only, and now inside the map, I will test the three console commands for exposure maximum, exposure minimum, and bloom scale to find the correct values that I want to use for this environment. For exposure minimum, I use the following console command. And you have to test this command in areas where your environment is being affected directly by a light environment. So I input the command and then test different values to see what the environment looks like. Then I test bloom scale and I change the values to see what bloom I want to use. And last, I test for exposure maximum value. And for this, I go into indirectly lit areas, into shadows, and I input different values to see what number looks the best. And as I'm doing this, I'm writing all these values down that I like, because I'll be using them inside the tone map controller. Once I find the values I want to use, back in the editor, I need to insert logic auto entity. This is what will trigger our tone map and all the values that we found. 
So you won't be actually inputting Auto Exposure and Bloom into Tone Map. You'll be inputting them into Logic Auto, which will trigger the Tone Map. So with Logic Auto inserted, I go into Properties and switch over to Outputs tab. And then here I set up on Map Spawn to trigger Tone Map Entity. And the three commands I set out to trigger are Exposure Maximum, Exposure Minimum, and Bloom. And with the parameter override of, this is where I input all the values I found in game. So when I start up the map, Logic Auto will automatically fire on map spawn to turn on tone map with the values that I provided. Next is color correction. I insert a color correction entity, go into properties, change lookup falloff end distance to negative one, which will make this color correction global. It will affect the entire map. And now I have to create a color lookup table. So what color correction does is it allows you to change the colors of your scene. You can drastically change how your environment looks. You can make it more saturated or desaturated. You can change levels, make it very contrasty, and basically change the entire color and the feel of your environment. So with color correction inside the editor, I now need to create a lookup table. And for this, I need to set launch options for the game to include dash tools to turn on the ability to launch color correction UI. I then open the previous compiled version of the map and bring up the console to turn on the color correction user interface by typing in color correction UI without any spaces. And through here is where you create your color lookup table that you'll use inside color correction entity. The way color correction works is you add different layers of adjustments, such as hue saturation value, curves, levels, and then you adjust each channel and change the properties by moving the sliders left to right and seeing how it affects your scene. And I spend a lot of time here adding new adjustment layers for balance, changing levels, updating hue, saturation, and value, and going back between all different adjustment layers to find what I like. I go ahead and save this color correction. Once I save this, I can reopen it and continue working on it anytime. And Source saves two different file types. One is the color correction that you can reopen back in game to continue making your adjustments. And a raw file is what I will use inside color correction entity. So inside the editor, I open up the properties for color correction and under lookup table file name, I type in the location for this raw file that was created. The proper path is materials forward slash correction forward slash and name of the raw file. And you have to type in dot raw at the end. And with this raw file and the color correction entity, your environment will display the new color that you saw when you were updating the color correction in game. Now I want to run a full compile HDR only to test color correction and tone map. In game I am observing colors, lighting, shadows, as well as trying to see if I catch any mistakes, problems, errors, and things I may need to fix. And now after you've tweaked your lighting, changed your atmosphere by inserting the fog controller entity, updated your tone map, and created a color correction, as well as fixed all possible errors and issues that you found, you will be at a point where you have to call your project finished and release it. And for your environment to be complete, you have to run a full compile. This will take a very long time to do, and the larger your environment is, the longer it will take. So prior to doing a full compile, make sure that your map is complete and that you've taken care of everything that you found and can think of. So to run a full compile, I first save the map as a final version, then make sure that everything in visgroups is visible and no visgroup is hidden, then run map and make sure that I am using expert mode. And in a drop down menu, I change to full compile final. This will take quite some time. So you may want to have a run in the background and come back to check on it. Then once the compile has finished, your map will launch and you will have your final BSP file. We are now done with this tutorial series. Thank you for watching, and here is the final environment walkthrough. Let's go, let's go!